Good morning and welcome to this GIRI webinar at which we're launching our latest research report into the use of technology to reduce error in design and construction. I'm going to give a short introduction about GIRI for those who are less familiar with us and then hand over to John Priestland of Priestland Consulting who carried out the research. And we're recording the session, so if you miss anything or need to refer back, then the video will be made av available via our YouTube channel. On the housekeeping front, can I ask you to mute your microphones if not speaking, but please remember to turn back on if invited to ask a question. If you don't mind leaving your video on, that's good because it makes the meeting feel a bit more vital. And any questions as we go through, please use the chat box and we'll try to pick those up at the end or get back to you after the meeting. If you have any tech problems, well, the usual advice, turn off and try again, i.e. leave the meeting and rejoin using the same link. So many of you may be familiar with Giri, uh, but I think it's worth just reflecting on some key points about the origins of our thinking and our key messaging. In 2016, we carried out a research project looking to establish what is the root cause of error and how much do we waste as an industry. We had contributions from many organisations who were willing to share their information with us, and this is what we found. The results showed how much waste was caused by error, 21% of turnover. Direct cost, NCRs and tablet reports, etc., 5% indirect costs that impact on others, the loss and expense claims, 7%. Unrecorded process waste, errors occur and are corrected but not recorded, but they still have an impact, 6%. And latent defects, identified and corrected after handover, 3%. Now the figure might be a bit higher or a bit lower, but it's the right order of magnitude. And if we think that the uh, turnover of the construction industry is what 100 billion a year that means we're wasting 21 billion pounds a year an average construction company makes about two or three percent profit so it's pretty much a no-brainer we need to do something the research showed these are the top 10 root causes and our activities following the result of the research have been targeted on the highest ranking on these highest ranking courses Planning is top of the list and design in one form or another features highly. And we can see there are also cultural, commercial and communication issues to be dealt with. We're here this morning to hear about the technology available to help in this endeavour. Now, Geary was established following the original research as a not-for-profit membership-based organisation with the strategic aim of improving industry productivity through the elimination of error and became a limited company in 2017. The research demonstrated the link between error elimination and productivity, and this helped to convince businesses in the industry as to the benefits of investing in a zero error program. But the world's changing and boardrooms are now recognizing the broader range of imperatives they need to satisfy, including safety, sustainability and quality, and, and uh, an error-free strategy provides a platform for achieving all these objectives, and our strategic aim now reflects this. So let's take a quick look at how Geary is going about seeking to achieve these objectives. We have uh, thought leadership. Uh, we've developed training courses covering leadership, interface management and supervisory management, and the training's targeted on cultural change that's needed to avoid error. We have campaigns, uh, marketing of our brand has reached Australia, the United States, and recently a contractor working in Fiji has booked some courses, a real cultural challenge. We have forums on a variety of subjects relevant to con current construction issues. And then we have our knowledge sharing. In terms of research, we have reports and guides we've commissioned relating to design, insurance and technology, and all these are available on our website and of course today we'll be adding to that resource. We're continually increasing our activity in terms of social media. We have a website regularly updated and newsletters, LinkedIn and Twitter or I think it's X now. 
Uh, and then on the networking front, we hold four members meetings a year, at which members are able to mix and discuss their experience with error reduction. So I've talked about the productivity gains, saving of time and money, but we also recognise the benefits on safety. An Australian study found that 37% of accidents occur during rework, and there's no reason to think it's much different here in the UK. In terms of sustainability, our carbon footprint is reduced if we avoid the waste of resources associated with error. The quality, ben the quality benefit is, uh, is pretty manifest. And correcting error takes time and money, so if we avoid it, our outturns in terms of price and completion will be more predictable, and overall the effect will be a better reputation. We have a number of working groups seeking to provide useful output on a variety of relevant error-reducing processes. Insurance is a challenge for the industry at the moment, and we recently issued our insurance guide looking at collaboration with the insurance industry. The BSA steering group was formed to assist in the implementation of the requirements of the new build, the new act and uh, its associated building regulations. And it's said you need to measure in order to manage, and we are working with the CLC to develop across industry quality metric, and you may have seen some press releases from the CLC in the last week on this subject. Our technology group has been considering how various technologies support our error avoidance and their beneficial use. It is this group that has sponsored the research and report we are launching today. Now let's hear from John and the team. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, good morning. Uh, everyone. Let me see if I can share the screen correctly. Hopefully you can all see that. So as Cliff says, I'm John Priestland. Uh, we led the research uh, and you'll hear from me and from John Roberts, who carried out a number of the interviews. And then you don't just want to hear from us. Let us introduce you to a, a technology founder and a user of, of the technology. So we're going to talk for about 20 minutes, giving an explanation of the report, the findings and the methodology. There'll be time for questions and answers uh, at the end. So the question of how to choose your digital tools is very similar to the approach you would follow for your conventional physical tools. We choose our digital tools in the same sort of a way. We make a choice as to the appropriateness of the tool in question multi-purpose, uh, quick and efficient, old style and uh, uh, easy to use. We make choices around how the tools connect together uh, in the digital sense. That might be a common data environment or uh, data schema. And of course, we bear in mind the choice of tools based on uh, the user and how he or she is going to use them. So nothing greatly revolutionary there. We also start uh, by thinking about the problem. Are we trying to put up a shelf or are we trying to open a, a tin? And so when we came to the challenge of uh, technology and tools, digital tools for error reduction, we followed a very similar approach. And Cliff has already uh, laid out the backdrop, uh, the excellent research that Geary have done over the years. This is a 2016 report. So our starting point was the problem and specifically uh, the top errors the top causes, root causes of error, which as Cliff has mentioned, start with inadequate planning, late design changes, poor communication, poor uh, quality culture. So there is a, a good uh, and structured sense of the problems with error that we're trying to help solve with technology. And then what we were able to do is to use uh, some thinking and some work that's been done by the CTEC Club in terms of the potential categories of technology that are out there to help solve the problems. And just a little word about the CTEC Club. Uh, the CTEC Club is a, a global community of founders and CEOs of construction technology startups. It formed in 2019 when 12 founders came together for a drink after work and to share the challenges and problems of setting up startups. It's now a global group of 386 founders in 30 countries. And I can see in the participants list, we've got three or four other CTEC Club members and founders who are who are joining us today. We'll hear from, from Daniel in a, in a few moments. 
Um, in the early part of this year, uh, we brought the founders together to brainstorm, first of all, what is this thing called construction technology? And then beneath that, to come up with a taxonomy, first of all, of things that we use construction technology to do, so that the words around the outside of this 10-sided shape, investigate, visualize, predict, optimize, and so on. And then 31 categories of construction tech from advanced ground scans number one through to insurance and risk management number 31. So this gives us a palette, if you like, of possible solutions to match up against the risk factors and the root causes that Geary's identified. So we did that connection. We mapped the root causes to the technologies, the problems to the solutions, um, the, the root causes on the left and the 31. 32 with asset management software categories of solution on the on the right hand side and where those connections are made um, that gave us areas of particular interest to shine our spotlight on uh, and those uh, those categories of particular interest were the ones on the screen digital twins program optimization design configurators procurement and contract management and, and so on but that doesn't give us enough precision to identify more precisely the sort of tools and approach that uh, companies looking to use technology to reduce errors might uh, might draw upon. So we then went into a structured uh, interview program. Uh, we asked questions of asset owners, contractors and consultants on the one hand, and we asked questions of technology providers on the other hand. Um, and I'll hand over to my colleague, John Roberts, who will share a little bit around the conversations we had and the interviews we did to try and get to that further granular level of detail as to, to where the error reduction technology really can make a difference. John. As John says, uh, we used a structured interview approach. If you've ever been quizzed by a third year student on their project, you'll know, you'll know what we were about. We started off with, a, with, a, with a, a standard list, but it's one of those things where as you do more of these interviews, you very re re quickly recognize where the commonalities are, and in some ways the conversations developed as we carried them out to allow us to start to explore areas of similarity and areas of difference. Um, we gathered our, um, uh, the, the people we were talking to really into two main groups, which I suppose is represented by, by uh, the uh, presentations you're about to see, users and suppliers. Um, from the user's point of view, you had the asset owners, contractors, and, uh, and, um, and that team, and the suppliers on the, uh, on the other side. Um, the contractors very much raised the fact they a complicated and fragmented industry uh, and, uh, and also the problems of innovation fatigue. They feel they're looking at technology but not yet, um, uh, uh, you're not yet addressing it. But one of the key things in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see there, the fact that actually people are seen as the key challenge for them, that, that actually they are, they are, you know, the fact that people need to want to adopt and not feel that getting swamped by the technology. Um, if you move on to the next one, John, on the, on the flip side, on the, on the, on the technology companies, um, they're addressing that in many ways. They, they see straight away the great user experience is key. And also you need to actually get to the point where it's a sort of viral spread is to use, to use a word that might, might, might bring other, other images, but the employees need to kind of want it and they need to see the benefit. There's an interesting issue about whether or not the technology is, is, is reinforcing bad practice or allowing increased bad practice by making life easier. In some ways, it needs to build on processes that are, that are already there. Um, and so it was very much about processes and people and then a lot of other issues, which we expand in the report, which you can then read at your leisure later. John. Absolutely. So this is giving you a taste and a flavour of the backdrop to the work that we did. There are quite detailed sections in the report covering this, which we hope you'll you'll look at uh, as the report is launched. And indeed, um, uh, it's out today. The essence of it is to help contractors and design consultants select the toolbox and the tools that they want to choose uh, to reduce errors. Everybody's tools and toolbox will be different. This is not a prescriptive um, report. This are uh, uh, some ideas and some suggestions. Um, and indeed, it's just the same as with a, a physical approach. Um, the uh, report gives you a sense of where to go for your tools, what to buy, and how to link them together. 
And the, uh, the conclusion, in a sense, on these two slides is that we found nine types of technology that we think can make a significant, uh, make a significant contribution to error reduction. Um, there's uh, there's check-in technology uh, where um, your automated system will check your BIM model, it will check your P6 schedule, it will check the integrity of your data, or it will check uh, the processes that you're following. And we'll hear uh, from, from Daniel O'Donoghue from Conquer in a moment. Um, so they, this is uh, automated ways of checking the system. And of course, you can use human quality assurance people to do the checking, but in, in lots of ways, particularly when it's data related, the data system can check more quickly and more accurately provided it's got the right rules and it proceeds in the right way. Then the second category of, of technology to reduce error sort of turns that around. Instead of having the technology uh, to do the checking, this is having the technology to automatically produce uh, the design or produce the schedule. And there are systems, design configurators and automated scheduling systems that will provide uh, a detailed design or, or produce the P6 program based on a set of rules, based on a set of constraints. And the logic there around error reduction is that provided those machines are, um, are programmed correctly and the rules are compliant, uh, they won't make the human error. They will lay out every room, lay out every P6 program correctly. The third category is workflow engines. And this is really understanding that errors take place between the, the handoffs and handovers across a process. People do not understand that the responsibility for uh, action has passed from a predecessor to them, and then they need to hand it off to a successor. Uh, so a workflow engine will help reduce errors by capturing and managing those processes, making sure the steps are, are clearly laid out and giving the human a nudge uh, if they're uh, the one who's not moving the, the process forward. Then we have visualization systems, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality that allow people to collaborate remotely, to look into BIM models and look at design uh, together uh, and to be able to go out on site and link between the physical and the digital. And we uh, have technologies that would allow people to carry out digital rehearsals so that when they go and carry out the task for real, they've already practiced and the team is clear about roles and responsibilities. We've then got uh, tools that support collaboration and communication that allow tasks to be coordinated better, improving interface management. And that might be information sharing. It might be the coordination uh, of, of teams. It might be allowing those teams to, to communicate better. For example, Mobilis Labs uh, uses a bone conduction uh, a system that allows the uh, construction uh, operator with their hard hat and their ear, ear protectors in place to be able to communicate with the uh, the sound coming in through the bone conduction underneath the ear. Error reduction comes because those teams can coordinate while still keeping uh, all of their necessary PPE in place. Uh, and then we've got computer vision that allows um, uh, computer uh, uh, cameras and automated um, visualization uh, AI to check uh, the progress has been made and objects and items have been installed in, in the correct uh, way in the correct place and also to provide consolidated uh, aspects of information in terms of, of reports uh, that, that add to the, the quality management process. Uh, similarly, IoT sensors out on site will also detect progress and anomalies uh, for example, is the machine in the right place? Uh, is something strange happening on a part of site that uh, could be linked to an error or could cause an error? And we have digital setting out tools that will take information from a BIM model and a geospatial sensor on site that will allow uh, the, um, the, the area or the lines that will indicate the area to be laid out much more ac accurately and automatically than humans can in terms of the laying out. <coughs> And then, <clears throat> strange as it may seem, document management systems, uh, a form of digital, uh, may be quite basic in some ways, but very fundamental. And one of the things in the interviews people have really um, emphasized, avoidance of uh, errors coming up from version control, 
avoidance of having all of those important documents managed locally in people's individual yellow folders in Windows, having proper naming conventions for uh, the, uh, the files, et cetera, and, and, and that supporting people working together on the file and collaborating as opposed to working independently. So nine categories of error reduction uh, techniques using technology. Some of that is very much common sense. Some of that is more out there and it is developing all the time. So if we came back and looked at this again in a year, then the technologies would have moved on. There may be some other categories and there would be some other examples of the technology in the column on the right hand side. But that gives you a flavor of some of the tools uh, that are available and that you might look to put in your in your toolbox. But it's not uh, just about hearing about the report today. Uh, I want to hand over to Daniel O'Donoghue, who's the founder and, and CEO of Conquer, to tell you about the Conquer uh, checklist uh, system as an example of a, a practical uh, a tool that you could look to consider using and as an example of the sort of thing that came out of our research. So, Daniel, if I can hand over to you. Thanks, John. Um, good evening, or I think good morning to the majority of you. Uh, as it says in our name, uh, Conga focuses on construction quality assurance. Our product sits under the categories defined in the report as site management and reporting, and as John mentioned, in particular, checking technology. In our context, the checking component is enacted by contractors during construction, predominantly with QA checklists or inspection and test plans. The report highlighted the importance of competent teams being a crucial factor for driving quality. And while checking can't typically improve a team's competency, uh, it can improve their performance. And it does this by helping them to prevent the errors that are driven by human nature, uh, the ones where we get distracted or simply forget to do things. Um, the report quotes the World Health Organization study about the application of checklists in surgery. Uh, in this study, they didn't alter the makeup of the surgical teams, but by simply implementing checklists before and during surgery, they decreased death rates by about 47%, which means patients were about half as likely to die uh, if the checklists were used um, during the surgery process. Checklists, or, or in a construction context, inspection of test plans, play a powerful role in reducing or preventing errors. For our time uh, over the last few years, we've spent uh, a large amount of, of research, um, we've done a large amount of research around the QA process um, and have built our product based on the research. Um, I'll touch on four key pillars that contribute to a great QA process from our point of view, uh, and then share a case study uh, where a contractor went from losing 10% of project costs to errors now, this is information they measured themselves uh, to ultimately delivering uh, a defect-free a defect work. Uh, can I go to the next slide, please, John? Uh, the first component, and I think probably the most crucial in our context, is simplicity, uh, especially around execution and data capture on site. Um, the report highlighted that the younger generations are typically more tech savvy and receptive. And I think while this holds promise for the future, uh, we have found that creating a simple and intuitive experience for site management has been really crucial in helping them to achieve engagement in quality processes, uh, which is, can sometimes be a challenge for a lot of uh, contractors. And we believe that lowering the barrier through simplicity drives this engagement. Uh, and it also increases the level of data capture um, uh, achievable by anyone who's responsible for QA on site. Can I grab the next slide, please, John? Uh, the second component is planning. Um, again, it was touched on in the report. It's important for helping the teams know what specifically they're checking within an ITP or a checklist for any given construction activity, uh, but also for um, understanding the frequency of these activities and their associated inspections. Planning out each of these tasks or milestones so that people know what they need to do ensures that things aren't missed and that the progress through the plan can also be monitored. Next slide, please, John. The third component is substantiation. This provides not only evidence that the QA process has been followed, but also provides a really solid record of work. And this is where it assists in getting buy-in uh, from other stakeholders that sit outside the team typically responsible for quality. Uh, for our clients, 
good records play an important role when it comes to getting paid. They use the evidence to support their payment claims, keeping things fair and accurate, and ultimately reducing disputes around progress and liability. This drives the value proposition of robust quality assurance across the business and increases the overall level of buy-in, uh, which again is really crucial um, when trying to shift the culture. Uh, next slide, please, John. The fourth is visibility. And this is about giving stakeholders uh, who aren't on the ground, internally or externally, visibility of the work. It helps them to understand where the issues are and it provides insight into the overall progress of a project. Uh, this enables them to drive further engage, uh, engagement and also drive the behavior that supports that. Um, and then next slide, please, John. Here I'll share a case study uh, from one of our clients, A. Smith. This uh, study actually won them an award with um, RICS as well. Uh, a. E. Smith, they are a mechanical contractor working on commercial and infrastructure projects. And as I mentioned at the start, before they implemented Conquer, they ran a project where it cost, uh, where they lost 10% of the project value uh, to rework. Historically, within their business, they saw QA as a cost, a burden, and certainly not a value add. Um, but by implementing Conquer, and even more crucially, driving a culture around quality, uh, they improved their performance, and a number of projects later delivered a work that was ahead of schedule, under budget, and defect free. And while the con consultants uh, responsible for inspecting their work were a bit confused when they couldn't find any errors, it ultimately improved the client satisfaction, and it also improved the team's well-being. There are a few things more frustrating and demoralizing than going back to fix up your mistakes. And for Jeff's team, it meant they were not only proud of their work, but it meant they got to spend more time with their families. And this, I think, highlights the role that quality can play regarding not only the financial benefits, but the wider impact on mental well-being uh, for the industry. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, uh, please head to our website. Thanks for your time. Daniel, thank you very much. Uh, Conco is one of about 30 examples of technology that we give in the report. And I really wanted uh, to be specific and give you an example of technology in action uh, rather than just having a, a general presentation today. So uh, do look for the, 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 the wide variety of technologies and technology providers in the report. Uh, but it's uh, great to hear from a, a technology founder and a startup uh, head. We also wanted to bring the lessons from a, a user, a, a contractor that's already using and deploying uh, technology to reduce errors. So, so John, uh, very pleased to hand over to you to talk through this slide. Um, great. Thanks a lot, John. Um, and thanks, Daniel. Really interesting. Uh, so good morning, all. Um, so I'm John Hodgins. I'm the engineering, engineering director for the infrastructure division uh, at Galford Train. And so I'm going to give a, a user's perspective on um, technology, use of technology in construction, and, and specifically to, to seek to reduce error. Um, I think it's important to say from the outset, we're really big supporters of the Get It Right initiative. Um, we've been members since it was launched back in 2017. And we're also working with John and Priestland Consulting as part of our digital strategy. Um, and we are already using a number of the applications that are referenced in the report and within the wider CTEC club kind of publications. Um, the slide on the screen now shows a few of the digital tools and applications that as a business we've introduced to help us reduce error either directly or indirectly. Um, <clears throat> John talked earlier about document management systems, which are maybe quite at the, the low level of, of construction technology, but we find them really useful so we can collaborate with clients, designers, and the rest of our supply chain, so we can digitize document review and review approval processes, um, and also make sure that the right information is available to the right people at the right time. Again, I think John mentioned it earlier, that the error can happen when people aren't using up-to-date versions of information. So, so that's a really important place where document management systems can play a, a really big part. Um, we use schedule checkers um, so we can quickly um, carry out health checks on programs um, and, and the more modern systems can even use AI and, and help us find areas in the program where maybe there's a particular risk um, or, or indeed a, an opportunity to maybe refine and, and improve um, the program. Um, digital rehearsals are something we use pretty regularly. Um, so we can visualize and rehearse the proposed sequence of work so that everybody's going to be involved 
understands their role and their responsibility, how the work's going to be done safely, um, but also in accordance with the specified requirements. And all of that can be done from the safety of an office in the site, uh, cabins or, or, or even virtually um, before any work's actually done and it is actually done out on site. Um, digital setting out um, means that we can extract information straight out of 3D models and use that directly for setting out the works, uh, thereby minimizing uh, the risks of, of errors resulting from manual calculations. Um, an augmented reality we, we're starting to use, so we kind of overlay um, the proposed works as a 3D model on a view of the real world that you see through a phone or a tablet camera. Um, and we can use that for things like task briefings and to help people understand what it is they're going to be building before again they actually start on site so you can identify clashes and the like. Um, and, and last but not least, uh, building on what Daniel's just spoken about, uh, we use um, technology to record the inspections that, that uh, are set out in an ITP. Um, and uh, we can also use those things to, um, to notify errors so that if we find an error, we can notify the subcontractor and they can be required to carry out the rework before the inspection checklist is, is finally signed off. And I think, you know, Daniel mentioned earlier about the whole work life balance and, and well being piece associated with this. As a young engineer, I remember, you know, filling inspection records and, and completing daily site diaries till quite late at night in the, the site office. Uh, one of the things that this technology allows you to do is to do that much more efficiently, effectively, thereby definitely improving that work life balance. Um, in deploying technology, we found it's really important to start with a use case or problem statement. Um, and then to, to find the right technological solution to that problem, um, uh, trial it, deploy it, and embed it. Um, there's a whole lot of technology out there at the moment, but if you start with the, the shiny, shiny application and then look at what you can do with it, you're much less likely to be successful. But it's also important to remember the art of the impossible, of the possible, sorry, is important. Um, if all we ever do is look to digitize existing processes, then you're probably not going to benefit, maximize the benefits that, that this technology can bring. I really do believe this Giri report is going to be very useful to help people under, better understand the ways in which technology can be used to reduce errors in design and in construction and to help with that art of the impossible. So, so helping to identify things that, that this technology um, makes possible that weren't possible before the technology is available. I just wanted to also pick out a quote in the report that I find really resonates with me and I think um, picks up on something John Roberts talked about earlier. Uh, the technology is only a small part of the challenge. The major part is the people and their motivations. You can never get someone to do something they don't want to do. Um, so you have to bring the project teams with you. You've got to involve them in deploying and embedding the technology and help them understand and see the benefits, how it's going to help them do their job more effectively and efficiently. And if you do that well, it's much more likely the teams will embrace that technology and run with it. And you'll get that viral um, kind of spread um, uh, of that technology because people just, they want it and they want to, um, they want to use it. Uh, so just to conclude, one thing certain, technology is here to stay and its use in construction is only going to continue to grow. And, and my view is this report is going to go a long way to helping people in the industry develop their approach to the effective use of technology for, for error reduction. And thank you very much, John. That's all from me. Fantastic, John. And your point around it being around uh, people, behaviours, culture leads very nicely on to this, which is our last slide. And we have a section in the report which reflects on this very point that it's not a, a question of applying technology in isolation, that technology needs to be aligned with the people and processes. Uh, you need uh, workflows so that the technology naturally sits in them. Uh, you need to make sure that people have the skills to adopt and adapt to the technology and that they have the motivation uh, and they see the logic and the benefits of, of using it. And we've set out and suggest uh, a digital maturity assessment approach around these five elements in the, the Pentagon on the right, that in developing uh, a digital maturity uh, approach uh, to consider capabilities and skills, to consider technology and data, 
uh, to consider standards and processes and strategy and governance and communication and collaboration. And you're only as good when it comes to deploying uh, technology as the weakest link in those five. It might be you might be brilliant on your communication and collaboration, but if your strategy and governance and your standards and processes aren't up to it, then you won't be anything like as effective. And I think the final point is that whatever your organization is on the adoption of technology in your digital journey, uh, the most important step is uh, to make the commitment and express the, express the wish that you want to improve and get better. And from that point, uh, the journey is only upwards and the journey is only positive. So we do hope that you will take some time to look at the report um, and uh, we are very happy by Cliff to answer some questions you may have this morning. Right, I'm unmuted again. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm enthralled by uh, what you've pre presented as the document and I've read it. <laughs> it just seems to have come to life for me a bit more this morning. So um, I do uh, recommend, obviously, but I do, you know, re really do recommend people look, look and read the document and think about some of the issues that have been raised. Um, we haven't actually received much. Oh, I've got a hand in the air here. So I've got a question potentially from a gentleman whose name's now ah, Richard Saxon. Richard, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good. OK, um, I'm in the information side of the business, uh, information management and uh, I noticed in your presentations you didn't actually mention using the uh, ISO 19650 information management standard, which uh, is what's turning conventional approaches to BIM into really good uh, processes with um, everything properly managed and labeled and uh, interoperable. Um, I would have thought that was foundational in any use of technology. So I, I don't disagree with that. Uh, we focus specifically on on the tools in this report. I think your uh, your ISO standards and uniclass categorization uh, and different uh, schemas and, ta ta and taxonomies are all around the um, the toolboxes, which we touch on uh, in part. I think what we've really been focusing on is the individual tools but i couldn't agree more that the way they fit together and to make sure that the information coming out of one system and coming into another is clear and un unambiguous is, is absolutely right but the, the errors fit into error reduction fits into a much broader class of problem statements be that safety be that productivity be that carbon all of which is linked together isn't it with that overall information management approach certainly thanks uh, we have a question in the chat from Philip Callow. Uh, I'll read it out rather than finding where Philip is. How do we manage the vast array of separate and or competing tech platforms? And is there a risk of too many platforms on one project? I think this is uh, going to somewhat a similar point that Richard was making about the stand getting some standardization so that there is interoperability um john do you want to uh lead on that or yes and i'll be interested in um maybe a, a little bit from daniel and from um from john h so i think it's a very uh, good and pertinent point we're very aware with our ctec club hat on that we have 386 founders in the club all of whom, in a sense, are offering individual point solutions. And back to the analogy of the um, uh, trip to B&Q and buying your toolbox, it's uh, inefficient uh, to have to go and make all of those individual buy decisions and inefficient if those tools don't work together. So we are encouraging the uh, independent founders and startups to work more closely together uh, and to create, um, as, as Richard's implied, information 
management and information exchange protocols that make that easier. Um, and I think it's important that the, the independent innovators uh, are able to do that. Otherwise, there might be the decision that large contractors take to go to a, a supplier like Bentley or Autodesk or Trimble. Not that there's anything wrong with them, but the power and speed of the independent innovation uh, is, is something to behold. Um, so, Daniel, I'll be interested in your views first uh, in terms of how you find it when you're talking to potential clients uh, around Philip Callow's point, and then, John, what your perspective is on the integration of the tools within Galliford Tri. Yeah, thanks, John. I'll actually reference um, John Hodgins' uh, point earlier about understanding the problem that you're trying to solve for. Uh, I think there obviously is a risk of having too many solutions. Uh, tech fatigue is a real thing and we encounter it quite often. Um, I think there's a component of interoperability uh, um, that, that's been touched on, which is, I think, important. And then I, I also think that it's a, a case of making sure that it's a really strong user experience. And we come up against solutions all the time that are often best in breed in one thing and then have developed a whole series of other functions that in our experience, more geared towards people who are office based. Um, so I think it's a, it's a balance. You have to understand the problem that you're looking to solve. Uh, definite preference to have 1 solution do all is fair and valid. I think for everybody, um, but it's really understanding kind of the problem and who you're trying to solve the problem for. And I think in the quality checklisting space, it's typically that site user. That's the really hardest person to get involved, to get engaged. And so that's where. Um, the priority sits for a lot of our customers and why they've engaged with us. John? Yeah, and John, sorry, John. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'd just echo what, what I said earlier and what Daniel's just said. You, you, you've got to start with the problem. Um, if you just keep getting distracted by new applications and it's that, oh, this looks like a, a good application, what can I use it for? You will undoubtedly get. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of pushback from, from the users because it will just feel like it's a scattergun approach. It's got to be much more strategic and focused and involve people from day one if you, you know, try and do stuff to them rather than take them on the journey, then again, you'd be much more likely to get pushback. And I'll just uh, do a shout out to the, the questioner, uh, Philip Callow, who runs a startup called Rosetta Risk Management which is focused on the insurance space. And one of the interesting things about the direction of travel of reduced um, errors and better quality management could and should be uh, reduced insurance premiums. So thank you for the question, Philip. We, we've, got, we've got some comments here, which I can uh, read out, which I'm not sure they prompt a question per se. Um, Lawrence has, uh, mentions the report uh, ON data standards and interoperability between systems and supports Richard with the drive to information management. Um, and so selection of tools has to fit into the informa information management framework, which I think is which is what, what we were saying. Um, and Ian McElwee is saying standardization around nomenclature of systems and products and components is a big challenge. Uh, which I think we all uh, accept, and this, this is this is where um, we've what we've been discussing in terms of we've got this variety of technologies, but you've got to pick the right one for your specific issue. On the information management side, um, you know, with the common data environment or whatever we, uh, however we term it, uh, I think it's important about feedback. In, in the context of Geary, we are about avoiding the error rather than necessarily just having the technology to make, make sure you spot the error and correct it. So what do you think, um, team, uh, the, the technology that you've been looking at, how is that helping with getting feedback of issues that have occurred and been dealt with uh, to avoid them in future? John, do you want to take that? Too many Johns, I'm afraid. Well, I'll ask you, John Priestland, first, and then you can ask it around your team. Yes. Um, well, 
I think uh, I think it's all around feedback and learning, and I think there's a, a whole approach to continuous improvement, which is really kind of uh, one of the things that stands out for me in terms of conquer is the sense of continuous improvement. And I think Daniel, your your checklists learn, don't they, as as as, um, as you go through. So it's not just a question of following the the static checklist. It's a question of um, those checklists improving over time and capturing the information. John, John, John yeah, I'll... yeah, did that Daniel first, and then maybe John Roberts have a go at, at the question as well. Sure, I'll be I'll be quite brief because like the, the checklist help our customers to learn rather than it being like an AI um, self learning. Uh, type thing, and I think like feed, feedback is crucial. We typically will always engage most of our customers with a pilot project first to actually validate it's going to work for them, and then take the lessons and roll from there. Um, and I think the most successful customers really lean in from a from a leadership perspective about driving that engagement. I think it, the culturally it plays a massive role uh, when it's driven from leadership to get that feedback um, and to make sure that they're you know driving continuous improvement within it. Okay, and, 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 right. I was just just picking up on that. It was interesting during the interviews. Um, probably two two separate types of behaviour. Talk, talking to the um, uh, talking to the software developers and vendors. Of course, they're having these conversations all the time. So in some ways, they 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 they're taking the temperature of lots and lots of people as they're as they're trying to trying to you know potentially get their product into the industry. So they provide a lot of really good feedback and a lot and a lot of. Um, yeah, for us, it was always an interesting conversation with them because straight away they had lots of experiences that they were seeing out in industry. On the other side, in some ways, it was a bit more like therapy because we have a fractured industry. Um, and that, uh, I would actually then, of course, emphasize that, you know, I think Geary is a perfect place to give feedback about frustrations and problems because, of course, you know, I think the shared platforms that we have um, as, as, as clients as contractors, as consultants are really, really important. So in some ways, you know, the opportunities that the organizations like Geary give to provide feedback on what the problems are and indeed what the, what the good solutions are is very important. Okay, um, I've got a question here from uh, Ray Coleman. Uh, there can be a significant outlay in the procurement, resourcing and training of these digital tools, which can, I presume, impact on tenders. In terms of clients and designers procuring construction work, is there guidance on how to specify adequately the use and adoption of technology to ensure that tender assessment is comparing like with like, especially considering the management of the assets whole life cycle post construction? Long question. Um, I think it's not a one word answer. <laughs> but, uh, how how does the technology help us with the procurement and tendering process? Uh, do you want to think yeah, about there's a, a, a few a few ways of answering that? First of all, within the construction technology landscape, and one of our thirty one hexagons is uh, contractual and procurement management, and there are specific tools like uh, Pro Tenders, Procure Pro, that are bringing excellence to that and have very dynamic workflow engines that drive across the uh, procurement life cycle. Um, the second thing I would say on, on procurement and tenders is my experience is the number one point at which operational teams are really motivated to innovate and use technology is at the point of bidding. And bidding is a good catalyst for embracing new technology. If you score nine out of 10 on innovation and you win the bid, I suppose the six out of 10 on innovation and you lose the bid. So I found that a very productive uh, time uh, in the in the construction life cycle. And the third thing is uh, through the CTEC Club, we are exploring with procurement authorities some of the challenges that the public sector in particular find in, uh, in, in procuring construction technology at scale. Uh, the public sector finds it relatively straightforward to run pilots when it wants to adopt innovative technology and it wants to run uh, an old style tender, the technology provider might not be very well placed to respond to that. But I think the point around how technology is evaluated on a fair basis um, in tenders is a good point. And one, if we do get the opportunity to engage with some of the public sector clients as we do, 
it's certainly one that we will look to bring in. It's a good point. Uh, Jan um, has asked, uh, he's, he's complimented the toolbox as is, with, but mostly software, uh, and wondering about uh, hardware technology like drones and robots and the like. Have you given much thought to that as a sort of next step in your uh, process of uh, techn technology research? Well, drones and robots uh, certainly feature in our uh, taxonomy in our 31 categories and uh, drones support visualization, robots support fabrication and, and all sorts of things. Um, our approach for this report was to start with the, um, the problem, to start with the, the underlying causes. We didn't see that close a fit between drones and robots specifically to error reduction, save as covered, for example, in computer vision. So if you think about a drone as a, a, a way of putting a camera or a device or a sensor and getting it to different places, it's like sort of, you know, uh, extending your arm and your reach. It's a computer vision or the sensor, the IoT sensor or the computer vision that helps with the, um, uh, with the error reduction. But I certainly think drone scans um, with looking at some really interesting technology that does hyperspectral uh, cameras on drone scans for um, uh, looking at flora and fauna. Uh, that's very interesting. So the technology is moving forward all the time. We have within the SeaTech Club some amazing um, wall climbing robots, uh, a startup called Housebots that can get the robots to climb up the walls and inspect the quality of technology in all sorts of places that humans find it hard to get to. So there's lots of stuff around drones and uh, robots. We didn't see the strongest of links with error reduction. That's why they don't feature so strongly in the report. Okay, I, I, we've got a lot of uh, very interesting conversation going on in the uh, in the chat, uh, which n I can't uh, convert directly into questions. But it, it it certainly means that we're getting some very good feedback on the subjects that we've raised and the context in which you've you've put them um, in the report. I think a general comment then, uh, which goes to a lot of these uh, discussions in the chat box, is this question of the techno technology being led by what issue you're trying to resolve or what your management system is dictating is something you need to address and then looking for the technology to do it from the toolbox. Um, and I, I want to emphasize which something which wasn't really within John's purview, but I've made a, a point of that Geary will be revisiting this um, research, this report annually, so that we will uh, update uh, our, uh, our gaze into the, um, the the available technologies and what what they can help us do and we will be doing that on an annual basis uh, because i think we recognize don't we that the uh, there is this massive advance that's taking place with technology in all sorts of fields and uh, so uh, and some of the things that we will be picking up on and dealing with will flow from the comments on the existing report that we've got some today. And we obviously hope that uh, when you've had a chance to read the report in some depth, it, if it doesn't answer the issue that you're, uh, that's come to your mind during this presentation, then you will be able to get in touch with Geary and we'll be um, building up a stock of things that need to be addressed when uh, I asked John to uh, sharpen his pencil again next year. So um, where are we up to? <clears throat> Resistance and confusion are the largest tech adoption barriers, but the gains for our sector are the largest of all, as productivity is central uh, to government's biggest driver. Now, one of the things that comes to mind for me is the, shall we call them the SMEs or the supply chain. And we have our large tier one contractors who um, have invested quite heavily in technology and technology solutions. 
Um, I think is it just to finish this off because we've only got two or three minutes left. Any thoughts on how um, this report helps uh, smaller firms to see the value in investment in technology to avoid error? Well, I hope that uh, the toolbox approach is very flexible and there isn't a sense that people have to go and buy the whole thing and everybody should start with what are the things that are the low hanging fruit and the opportunities to change and make a difference and a tier two or tier three can go and choose some very straightforward basic things that can make a significant difference and also be more aware if on a project as a whole error reduction is being mandated by the client or by the tier one or the tier two what is out there um, but i think there's a comment uh, in the chat around around the cost of this. Hopefully the report will make it easier for people to see what's there um, like a like a catalogue uh, and make some good choices. And the fact that we've done the research uh, through Geary, I think it's great that we've been given the opportunity to do so means that tier twos and tier threes will be able to find the right technology for them more easily. Thanks. Well, um, I think that's uh covered a lot of ground this morning. And as I said, I think people need to read the report. I take from this that the common data environment or the, the management system, document management system has a very fundamental role to play in uh, getting uh, the right information to the right place at the right time, which is, uh, which is a fundamental GIRI requirement. So I think there's a, there's a lot here. Uh, and I wanted to thank you, John, and your team uh, very much for pu pulling this research report together. I know it's not been uh, straightforward in some cases. Uh, and thank you to Daniel and the other, well, one of the other Johns, or both other Johns, for, um, for your contribution today and your uh, continuing support of Geary. So uh, with that, I'm going to bring the webinar to an end. Um, if you're interested in uh, anything that you've seen today or heard about Geary, then we have our website and you can find out about us more there. So thank you very much, gentlemen. I'll leave you with that. <laughs>